Here's Jamie. Awesome. Hey, so I, I want this to be really engaging, guys. And I think that as the last talk before a happy hour, it's just appropriate to hand away some good. So we're going to be giving away drink tickets to people who ask questions. I hope I have enough of them. I honestly have no idea. But I, I, I want you guys to be ready. So one of the things that's always perplexed me as you kind of look at the space of open source is that there's really a dark side. We implicitly trust open source as a whole. And as our organizations start to push the zero trust narrative, we start to need to think about how we trust implicitly open source software and the maintainers versus how we approach the rest of the industry. So, can you hold the mic closer, please? Yes, can you? Wow. <laughs> Not too close. Yes. How's that? Perfect. So, Today, how is modern code assembled? 80% of the code, or 90% of the code that create the software that powers the industry today is code that you didn't write, or your team didn't. Modern software development is modern software assembly, not development. And as we look at today's industry, we see that software reuse is growing 33% year over year. And it's important to remember that when you think of open source, this is about software reuse and accelerating innovation. And that's something that is going to be a competitive disadvantage if you don't reuse software. If you can't go to market as fast as your competitors, you are going to lose out. So open source is here to stay. This is a risk that everyone in the industry must accept if they are going to stay reasonably competitive. That being said, we need to manage it more effectively. What happened with open source? Developers thought they got Disneyland. They say, I can use this, it meets my use case, I just Googled it for five seconds and now I applied this documentation and oh, it works, great. But what they actually got as they started to use more and more software was dependency hell. And by a quick show of hands, who here knows what dependency hell is? Can uh, anyone give me an example? Go ahead. Where, like, kind of like what you said, you have so many things, dependencies, and they're changing fast enough for it's hard to keep up with. Okay. And anyone else? You upgrade one library and it breaks compatibility with another library. Yes, it, Python is the worst in my opinion. <laughs> Go ahead, Adam. I laugh about regularly is people are very concerned about ensuring that they don't bloat their software. And actually one of the most common things that I see in software build materials is people having four different versions of the exact same thing. So, okay. So just, I know that this audience is probably expert level, beginner level. I'm gonna go intermediate, but I wanna explain a bit for the beginners in the audience. So what is, software dependency and what happens when you reuse software. Ultimately, your developers who are building an application or the final goods that are being sold or delivered to an end customer are going to reuse what are called direct dependencies. This is the software that you implicitly choose to, explicitly choose to trust. Now, each of their direct dependencies is generally going to bring in a large number of transitive or indirect dependencies. And can anyone guess in what, on average, in say the NPM ecosystem, which for what it's worth is out of control, <laughs> how many de transitive dependencies come along for the ride each time that you choose to reuse one bit of software? Go ahead. I'd say one to 300. One to 300? Well, it is in that range. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm gonna say 50. 50, closer. Colder. One more. Give her a drink ticket. The answer is actually 77. <laughs> so on average in the NPM ecosystem, 77 transitive dependencies are brought along for every additional direct dependency that you bring in. 
Now in Maven, that's going to be 14. In Go, that's going to be smaller. But at the end of the day, the important thing to remember is that this represents the majority of your code base. And transitive dependencies as a whole bring in a significant risk posture and profile that organizations aren't tending to manage. People know their direct dependencies. People don't always know their transitives. And if anyone were to guess, what percentage of vulnerabilities do you think exist within transitive dependencies versus direct dependencies? Anyone? 70 to 30 percent? 80? Close. Exactly. So we did a, a research study on the Harvard Census Review, which was effectively a review of all of the most important open source projects. We analyzed the vulnerabilities that were in that list of known open source projects. And the number of vulnerabilities that are in transitive dependencies is actually 95%. And to me, that's terrifying because your dependabot's always going to keep you up to date. Your ability to manage direct dependencies is going to be reasonably easy, but the complexity of reducing or managing known vulnerabilities actually is going to come from your direct dependencies. I'm sorry, your transitive dependencies generally. So what are security people doing? Well, this is our proxy to risk in the industry today, but this isn't the only real risk. And as we look at the proliferation of known vulnerabilities, how do we manage a different subset of risk? Because I would challenge the industry today to say that most of the industry is actually stuck on vulnerability and license compliance and isn't thinking about real supply chain risk. So the intention of this talk is really to give you a taxonomy and a bit of a high level understanding of what is supply chain risk. So here's a recent example. Gorilla is a web toolkit, one of the most popular ones for Go. And ultimately, it's got tens of thousands of weekly downloads. It's heavily depended on. And it's one of the most popular Go-based applications that are reused in the ecosystem. But ultimately, recently in 2002, the maintainers effectively said, you know what? This is taking up too much of our time. We're no longer going to commit to this. And as they abandoned the project, they've archived it. Now any known issues in the actual software itself isn't going to be managed. The problem with this is that most people look at open source not as software reuse that they own. They look at it from the perspective of software outsourcing. We need to stop thinking about outsourcing our software to an open source community. These guys are not hey, they don't give a shit. At the end of the day, it's your responsibility. When you own open source, this was news to people. When there are issues or bugs, they won't be fixed. You have to vendor this code now. Now, that being said, what are other forms of attacks? So when you download a software, you're going to use something like a package manager, such as NPM, such as Maven, such as Go, in order to really download that software and that becomes an attack vector. Because if you confuse a package manager, well, you can download different software than you intend. And that was something that really hit home with Meta's PyTorch package. And this happened in late 2022. Someone published someone, uh, something under the exact same name to PyPy, which is the package repository for Python. And once they published that, all package managers have a priority where they look. PyTorch is actually housed in a custom package repository. And therefore, when someone published something on PyPy, well, the package manager started looking for that code when everyone was intending to download PyTorch from somewhere else. What you got was a potential malware threat. This is called dependency confusion. When you attack a package manager, you're attacking its priority structure. I look first here, then I look here to download software. And this becomes a natural question of how do you understand how you are building things? By a quick show of hands, who here 
knows or prevents the package repositories that are public from being used in your organization. Okay, so about 25% roughly. And of all of you, when you look at your software, do you know how frequently your developers are actually bypassing that? Because what we find is that most people use an Artifactory, or a Nexus, or a JIT, and they are ultimately trying to understand the pro how to reuse code fast. If you block that, they're gonna find another way. There are a hundred different ways to use software. And ultimately, as security professionals, we need to ask ourselves the questions. Where is our software? What versions do we need to update to? What applications are affected? And am I ex exposed to security risk? Because ultimately, the point is that open source is more complex than we think it is. It is not the Disneyland experience. You have dependency help. Engineers are frequently wasting engineering cycles simply trying to update software packages because they introduce breaking changes across multiple versions. And because ultimately security teams are throwing a list of vulnerabilities to them, to developers and asking them, please fix this. By a quick show of hands, who here generally manages vulnerabilities by sending a list to their development teams and starting to partner with them on that journey? One, two, three. <laughs> you guys are lying. But, <laughs> but ultimately, what we learn here is that the developers start to hate you for that. We need context. Developers are going to waste engineering cycles by false positives and simply by things that don't impact them. There's also significant operational risk associated with open source software. At the end of the day, these software dependencies are generally going to be uninventoried and unvalidated. Frequently, software is actually unused, which introduces unnecessary risk and ultimately also bloats your applications and impacts the performance of them. But how many security teams today say, do you use that? What processes do we teach as an industry to systemically harden our software? Because no developer wants to remove software. They don't know what it's gonna break. How do we as security teams start to champion reducing software bloat to downstream impact the cost of our vulnerability management programs. And finally, there are emerging attack vectors like dependency confusion that we want to address. But today I want to show you a taxonomy of attacks at the highest level and use that as a form to start to get you to think, what is software reuse and what are the risks that I'm exposed to as an organization? By a quick show of hands, how many people think that developing and advertising a malicious package is one of the most effective ways to distribute malware across an organization? One. And how many people think that creating a name confusion attack is the most popular way in order to distribute malware? Okay. And how many people think subverting legitimate package techniques is one of the m most effective ways? Well, effectiveness is probably the wrong term, but creating name confusion attacks re represents about 65% of all supply chain attacks in the industry. And this includes things like type typo squatty, like dependency confusion. Or if you're familiar with this recent Sentinel-1 headline, well, Sentinel-1 didn't even publish an SDK, but it was confused and reused across many organizations. So, what is developing and advertising a malicious package from scratch? Ultimately, your developers are out there, and they are simply thinking one thing. I need to get a job done. Well, ultimately, people are going to go out there and say, I have just the thing. And by making something useful, you have now established yourself in the chain of trust. And ultimately, supply chain attacks are about understanding your model of trust. By making something useful, that maintainer has established themselves 
in your trust chain. Your developers are just going to use it. The majority of developers just use Google in order to analyze the software that they select. And they're not going to ask themselves, is this sufficient? Is this suspicious? And by making something useful, you have a scalable attack vector. Now, how can you develop a malicious package from scratch? Well, you can make something useful. You can add in software that you depend on for your useful project that doesn't even exist. You can use that as a call option later in order to inject malware into these systems. So you've seen tons of Docker images that have malware introduced. We regularly see malware threats that are introducing backdoors. When you look at the NPM ecosystem, people can really easily change a pre or post install script in order to really start to understand, can I inject code into this as a path to compromising a system? And by developing something useful, you easily have control over that trust injection. So what is name confusion, and how do we start to manage that? Well, at the end of the day, people are trying to reuse software. They're going to look for a specific thing, like URL lib three here. And by simply removing this three, because humans are humans, they're going to create typos. Human error is a natural thing. Creating name confusion attacks are just a path to establishing compromise of human error. And your team is going to think, nothing is really weird here. Well, that's why typo spawning attacks, dependency confusion attacks are so frequent in our industry today. And this is the most common way to compromise the software supply chain. You've got people saying, for instance, 701 had a fully functional client that was published under their name where people trusted that vendor relationship that wasn't even theirs. You've got teams changing small digits. You've got people attacking your brand and downloading, go ahead. There are defensive patterns that can be implemented. It is going to be language specific. So for instance, in NPM and Python, you can establish a namespace, um, an NPM that looks like an at sign and then your company name. And you can use that to say, any software downloaded from me has a namespace that's much more difficult in order to create confusion there. You have to create confusion at the level of the namespace in that regard. Um, Maven, for instance, has namespaces implicitly defined in its design. Python does not. So when you look at your artifactory or you look at the software that you use, just simply having a namespace associated with it is an effective way to begin to mitigate this. I'll start by saying it's not foolproof. I'm typo swatting several popular GitHub actions, including the folks at AWS, today. And one of the things that I've found, just for research purposes, is that you can still typo the namespace, but it is a way to reduce the probability of human error. So, at the end of the day, name confusion with legitimate packages is a path forward. And supply chain attacks are scalable because of human error. The last and probably the most interesting way of defeating trust in a software supply chain is subverting a legitimate package. How can you do this? You can subvert a legitimate package by accessing its source code. You can subvert it by accessing its build system. Or you can compromise the download of the actual software itself. So what is subversion of the package? Ultimately, you could be using something for years. And a regular update can turn into malware or malicious code. So how does this happen? You can become a maintainer of a project. And we talk about trust today because when you use open source software, you implicitly trust each of those maintainers. Do you know anything about them? 
Ultimately, one of my favorite ways to compromise the software supply chain is to look at the email domain of maintainers. The email domain of maintainers frequently may not be Gmail. They could expire, they could have vanity domains. And when you look up expired domains of those maintainers, you can subvert a legitimate package by compromising that, purchasing the domain, and using that as a path to now control the software that is trusted by an organization. So if we're not auditing each and every individual software update, which I'm not advocating for because that is costly and doesn't scale well, how do we start to understand what software we use is being modified or corrupted? So I want to pause here for a second. I do want to go into how do we protect ourselves, but what have you guys thought about managing your software supply chains? What are you doing today in order to protect yourselves from subversion of legitimate packages? And this does have a point. There are only about three or four common answers, and I know them already. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so you would prefer to copy software over depend on software. Okay. So that's to say, have mirror your packages. So well, why would you mirror? The reason I ask that is because if you're just mirroring, you're going, you're using a proxy, but you're still downloading the same software. You're not a curator, you're not a consumer. You're curating and deciding in the engineering chamber if I'm going to accept that package and bring it into the manager for use. Yeah, this is the version that we accept. Like, go here, go here. There you go. That is one path. I will say the, the copy versus depend one is part of the Go philosophy and uh, something that will never work in NPM, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts before I continue? Scan, scan, scan the you can scan the software you use, but how many of your scanners are checking th for things like unexpected pre-install scripts? Or how many things really understand if the software is writing to the host operating system in a malicious or a benign way? And that's something that is incredibly difficult. When we see a security advisory in a popular library, we go, oh crap, are we using that anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> Said <it> everyone. <laughs> and just one more. What are you doing in order to protect yourselves? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Way more legitimate than most people think. So, ultimately, how do you protect yourselves? The, while we say SBOM, the truth is that SBOM is simply an inventory of your software. Having a software inventory is foundational to understanding the trust relationships you have in your software supply chain. Patch management is one thing. I will say that patch management, many people think of it as I'm going to automate this by just having something fixed in my next build. I'll always be on the latest version. That is a poor practice. Go ahead. I noticed you have RAS there. There's another one I asked in RAS about the patch security testing. Those ones are looking at many insiders view, so that it actually sees whether something interesting is happening and erase it more. That seems to be a lot more effective than all the stuff. If I download something that's going to scrape my environment variables, I would prefer to know that something is running the env command in my environment, and you can do that at runtime. So, how do we manage this? I will say there's three phases of maturity, and the vast majority of organizations are on this. They look at the tools and, and the controls that they have as a way to say, these are the things that we can use to protect ourselves. They're going to use vendor tools for SCA, application security testing, and RASP. Some teams are going to prevent script execution. Some teams are also going to audit the source code. I will say that 
understanding if source code is malicious is an incredibly manual and specialized process. This is something that you can scale to a reasonable extent, but at the end of the day, if software is malicious, it's gonna be removed from an open source package repository. It's going to be reported. So this is where your curated mirrors do fail because you now need to understand what is malicious packages so that they can be removed. That is important when you do have a mirror. There are pros and cons with both. Now, that being said, what are ways to mitigate supply chain attacks? I would say these things help on the far left side. And this is the initial phases of maturity that most organizations are in. That being said, I would say that the most important thing to mitigate with supply chain attacks is reproducible builds. We'll also say that the vast majority of developers in the world will fight you on this one. Because how many people use NPM CI versus NPM install? And NPM CI is what is actually going to enable a reproducible build because it respects your log file. NPM install is going to download a new software each and every time unless you've pinned each version, which let's be honest, nobody does. And if you don't have a reproducible build, each time that you build that software or install it, your build specifically, but each time you build that software, your bill of materials is going to change. In NPM, if you run NPM install, you're going to generally get the latest version or something defined in a version range. And if someone publishes a new version tomorrow, your build has changed. And that's something that not many security people consider. So uh, I want to ask this crowd, where are you on your journey to reproducible builds? Or are you even starting that journey or thinking about that journey? Anyone? Go ahead. So you do you have reproducible builds in your organization? Okay, that's impressive actually. In Docker, that's actually something in the hospital. Yes, that's why we don't do That's fair. Anyone else? Let me give you a quick example. Um, I was doing software delivery of a Docker container. Um, NPM specific packages don't necessarily respect semantic versioning. Semantic versioning is something where you generally define if a breaking change occurred or if minor updates occurred. And because an upstream package was published with breaking changes, it broke the app. And when we tested it, it worked fine. When we shipped that same application to our customers, a breaking change was introduced. Now, all of that changes if you start to move down the path toward reproducible builds, but that path is brought with strife and also comes with a cost. What are other people doing? People are looking at preventative squatting. People will actually if they publish internal first party libraries that these are frequently reused, they will reduce the probability of dependency confusion by publishing that same name externally. If you can control the name externally, that is where you can start to reduce the probability that someone can confuse a package manager. People will detect typo squatting using things like the proximity of words. That being said, this is something that's rife with false positives. It is an investment to make. People are signing their code. They ultimately want to trust it. And how can other teams really start to reduce their supply chain risk? Copy versus depend is 
likely the most effective way to reduce supply chain risk. It also forces you to update and fix bugs, but it's also easier than just building everything from the source yourself. So ultimately, version pinning, removing unused dependencies, systemic hardening, ensuring that you have reproducible builds, and checking for the integrity of dependencies is how you start to manage this risk more effectively. But that being said, we already ask our development teams to do too much. The last thing that we want is to add more to this list. We need, as an industry, to understand how to build things, to reiterate your message, in order to effectively manage the software that we use today. And if we ever want to transition to managing real software supply chain trust relationships and risk, instead of managing known vulnerabilities and managing license risk, this is how we do it. Understanding how to build so that we can give more prescriptive guidance to our development teams, understanding our applications, this is critical in order to manage supply chain risk, but it's something that requires specialized knowledge. So how do you manage software reuse? And what do you look at software supply chain? Or are you looking at just known vulnerabilities today? And I know that the answer is the latter for the vast majority of the world. That being said, I challenge everyone in the industry how do we start to transition from compliance to managing these trust relationships that we might not even know we have? So I'll pause there. Any questions you guys have? Adam? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sure you're going to do this at the end of the day, but when you start talking about trust, I start thinking about uh, your question about trust and trust and the question the uh, Dennis Ritchie's turn lecture, in which he talked about how to push Trojan horse into a compiler. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that the question of how do we actually trust all of this software that's coming in might not be a solvable problem. Is there a subset of the problem that we might be able to, to try and make my question more productive? Mm -hmm. Is there a subset of the problem we can solve that's not quite at the level of I think the path to re using re reproducible builds is, I think, the most effective and scalable path to solve the trust problem, because at least there you have a static list of what you trust, and there you understand what you are trusting. Go ahead. Can you define reproducible builds? Because I think you may be Okay. When I say reproducible build, that means that I'm going to get the exact same package of versions you know, and the complete SBOM every single time that I build the software and that the SBOM will be consistent. It will be reproducible. that you have in your organization is a systemic way to harden. I think that tree shaking in general is something that I think the intent is performance, systemic hardening. That being said, it is both. I think security teams don't have enough conversations about how do I improve performance? Because that is ultimately the way that you get developers to systemically harden your environment to a limited extent. I think tree shaking is wonderful. I think copying, not depending on software, is wonderful. It does come with associated operational overhead. And I consider that operational overhead the overhead of the security control. Um, but ultimately, probably a more systemic way. Software, you talk about okay, explicitly we're going to use these packages, these exact versions. 
rebuild the consistency? Is that, or do you just say, because I know it's maybe something to say gradually it's built, gradually it's built to this, and that's sort of the loose coupling. Or as you can say explicitly, this version, even if it's slightly older, but it's a day older, so the version thinning is the key. Yeah, so version thinning reduces the probability of attacks, it doesn't solve it. I'll say that because when you thin a version, you are saying, I'm going to use this direct dependency the same way every time. That being said, when you pin a version, you don't know if each one of their software packages are pinned down the entire tree. So uh, unless you're practicing something like you using and respecting a lock file each time, in which case that doesn't even completely solve the problem, but does mostly solve it, that's how you start to, I'm sorry, I got way too off track there. But I think in practice, most people use version ranges. And that's something that, sure, it helps them stay up to date. It actually likely solves vulnerabilities without needing to touch them in many cases. That being said, the operational excellence and reduction of supply chain risk and actual availability risk comes by with reduction of builds. How far do you think we can get with sandbox then? So like, if, if I'm importing less tab, like a string formatting library, I can say it should have permissions to access the file system and then that be systems that let you enforce that, kind of like with mobile have permissions. I haven't seen that too much. Um, I've seen people talk about it. I haven't seen any practical implementation. I don't know. And that's simply because I haven't ever seen it used in practice. I am also not an expert in the mobile domain. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I can't answer that more effectively, but I saw something sparking your eyes when... <laughs> nope. Question was check that the the SHA 256 sum or really an integrity check in general of the, the software artifact is the same. I think uh, I think that's reasonably fair, but I think that that also introduced. What are you going to do if it's not? I'll have to go back and check. You know, I'll have to iterate through the entire list to see which one might have introduced the the difference, right? I mean, it's a manual process, but I'll have to go through the entire list. In the, in the case that it does not. Yeah. I, I think the whole conversation about reproducible builds is a conversation about trade offs. The trade off you make when you don't have a reproducible build is that you introduce operational overhead and a uh, chance of breaking changes and supply chain risk. The trade off you make when you do try to attempt to get reproducible builds is that you're introducing overhead of management cost and update cost. And simply just getting two reproducible builds is much more costly. So it, it, it is a cost trade-off. I, I haven't thought too deeply on integrity checking of binaries and what the, that cost would be, but I imagine that's just shifting the cost of process when reproduction fits. Mm -hmm. See, that's 
part is that if you start taking dependencies and just allowing them to update it, you're in potentially introducing new risks that you haven't accounted for yet. But the opposite is, if you pin a version and then you do nothing about it, three years later, there's all these CDEs that are attached to things that you didn't know about. So there has to be maturity to review. Anything you're willing to take a dependency on needs to be treated like your code. Would you actively monitor and manage your code? You should actively be monitoring the third party dependencies and bringing them in only after they've been reviewed, audited, whatever your process is, into your package manager and not allowing anything to be built that doesn't pull from that. So the developer working from home that's not on the VPN, his build's going to fail. He's going to try to go and get a different package from a different source. That should fail too. And that's just part of your, your building process. Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of feel like this is the we're going to test other people's patches before deploying them solution. And that, that's led to really long patch times. Very, and so I wonder about the practicality of actually pinning and approving all the changes so that this is 80% of your software, then this is also 80% of your software changes. My yeah, no, I, I think it's a fair. I, I, my response to that is that, again, it's about trade offs. If you're willing to say, we're not going to build this component ourselves, we're going to take a dependency from somebody else that we have decided to trust, someone higher up at the architectural level must have went through a process to review and accept that risk. And the problem we have is that developers these days, hey, I see this new NuGet package, I'm just going to pull it in, it's going to work so great. And no one's reviewed it, no one understands it, and now there's this unknown dependency risk that we've now introduced. That shouldn't be allowed. There should be an expectation that if you trust something externally, fine, there should be an approval process to that because we're as a company saying we're taking on that risk and we need to be willing to review it, monitor it, manage it within a reasonable amount of time. I, I want to draw back to what you were saying, I'm sorry about your name, but the, the point about behavioral change, I think may be an important part of the And so I just want to focus a little attention on that. So. Yeah, I've, I've seen, uh, I, I forget, there was a JavaScript security ecosystem tool uh, for like managing NPM risks specifically that's trying to detect behavior changes with this version. Oh, um, I, I forget the name, it was, it was it's very- It's uh, Socket. Yeah, Socket. Uh, so that was, that was very promising. Like that, that's kind of, you know, shifting further left would be you're sandboxing the capabilities of this library and then you can know when the permissions change to take a closer look. This is why we gave the beer tokens. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we'll wrap that up. So, are you good? That was awesome. I love when we have this kind of conversation. Please, round of applause. <laughs>